Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q and in this video I'm going to look at the Tier 7 German Tech Tree light fighter, the BF-109G Gustav. Hello there, and on the tarmac outside my hangar is one of the most recognisable aircraft in the game, the BF-109, and in this case it's the G variant, which is the Tier 7 Tech Tree German fighter. And in real life, this was the most produced variant of this aircraft, serving from 1942 through to 1945, probably. The K-series was introduced in 1944. But of the G6 variant alone, there were 12,000 units. Uh, massive production run. Uh, in the game itself, I think it's arguable that of the four BF-109s running from Tier 4 through to Tier 7, Tier for Tier, this is maybe the worst. Shares that dubious distinction with the F at Tier 6. So we're going to take a look at the statistics of the aircraft in a moment. I won't be explaining how the statistics spreadsheet works. If you need a refresher on that or you've never encountered one of these spreadsheets before, there's a link below the video to a short instructional video on that topic. Make use of that and then come back here. So without further ado, let's go and look at this aircraft's attributes. So here's the spreadsheet for all of the Tier 7 fighters, and I have to scroll off to the right for a long time to show you them all because there are 15 of them spored for choice at Tier 7. If we take a look specifically at the BF-109G and the gun armament, the business end of the aircraft, we can see the rating is 16, the cumulative DPS is 278. I'm going to drop you straight down to the worst in class figures here, and you can see, according to this legend, these figures are the third worst in class on both counts. I'm afraid the armament is not strong on this aircraft, and in fact it's the worst in class for any tech tree fighter. The only two that have worse armament are the LA-9RD and the Yak-3RD, both premiums. So that's a bad start. And the weaponry consists of two weapons groups. There's a single 30mm cannon with 180 DPS, 240 rate of fire, and a range of about 1,890 feet. So not terrific. Um, the auto-aim angle, dispersion angle, and overheat time figures are probables derived from other guns of the same type, but on a different aircraft. So they may actually be slightly different, but I believe the auto-aim angle is two degrees which means you have to aim very carefully with this gun, which is tricky when you're shooting at something that's banking away from you, i.e. a deflection shot, especially if you're trying to also uh, uh, land the machine guns at the same time. The dispersion angle is 0 0.6, not terrible, but also not one of the better figures. So the further away the aircraft is, the more chance you have of the single cannon shot missing. And an overheat time properly of six seconds, which is neither here nor there. It's not good and it's not bad. As far as the machine guns are concerned, again, these figures are probables, uh, but probably a, a, an auto aim angle of four degrees, which you would expect for machine guns. So you'll get a little bit more help here. Um, dispersion angle probably of 0 0.7, which is actually fairly good for machine guns, uh, but obviously worse than the cannons, which is typical as well, and probably an overheat time of around 20 seconds. So you can keep these firing, especially if you've um, got your weapons group separated, which I don't but I would like to, uh, you can keep these guns firing for longer. Um, and if you compare that to the P-51D Mustang, which is a high energy fighter and has had its 50 cals or 12.7 millimeter guns, as they're called in the game, buffed fairly recently, the range on those machine guns is 1,948 feet uh, and the rate of fire 800, DPS 62 for each, and that outputs 372 DPS. So you don't really want to be going head on with one of these. And the same story with the Chinese Mustang, which for all intents and purposes is pretty much a copy of the P-51D Mustang, the American one. So if we consider this as a high energy aircraft, um, you're going to be disappointed with the armament. If we look at the I-220, which is something of a similar characteristics, um, you can see it has four 20 millimeter cannons, 380 DPS and a rating of 22 and a lot better range, for instance, 2297 feet. Uh, better auto aim angle, the same sort of dispersion angle, uh, the overheat time is a bit more, uh, so that makes these guns slightly less, less usable from that viewpoint. Um, the Kostikov 302, which is a premium, again, the range is 2165, better uh, auto aim angle, better dispersion, 
slightly worse overheat time. And you're seeing a familiar story here. Best, second best in class figures here for the Meteor F1. Range is now all the way up to nearly two and two and a half thousand feet. Uh, still slightly better dispersion angle, um, slightly better, sorry, auto aim angle, slightly better dispersion angle and the overheat time approaching the same as the 30 millimeter cannon. Beginning to get the um, story here. The weaponry is outclassed uh, by many of the aircraft here. And if we go all the way across to the right, we'll actually see the best in class, uh, which is actually a really good turn fighter with a good altitude performance, significantly good plane this, the Ki-84 Hayati. If we just look at the two 30 millimeter cannons it has, the range is slightly better. This auto aim angle is definitely better, three degrees. Dispersion is unusually high and the overheat time is four seconds here, but then it also has 20 millimeter cannons on top um, with figures which are certainly at least comparable with the 30 millimeter cannon on the BF-109G, if not actually better. And that range figure is definitely better. So you have to watch it. You don't really want to be doing your head-ons in this, but then this isn't a turn fighter and it isn't that highly maneuverable. However, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Survivability, so-so. Uh, Pretty good fire resistance figure, which is usable. You need to think about that. Uh, might want to put on a first aid kit if you configure the aircraft carefully rather than a fire extinguisher, for instance. But other than that, it's all much of a muchness, and that's not unusual. The figures for survivability tend to be pretty compressed. There's no standouts and no particularly bad aircraft. It's the turn fighters that tend to be a little bit more fragile, unsurprisingly. Airspeed, it's on the good side. Rating is 56, which is normally the third best in class shed with the P-51D Mustang beside it. Uh, the best in class is unsurprisingly the Kostikov, but that's mainly because it's superb under boost. Its cruise speed is pretty bad. So if you catch one of these without boost, you'll overhaul it very easily. And then the Meteor is also pretty quick and that is good under cruise, but funnily enough, its maximum boost speed isn't very good. So you might be able to actually stay with that for a little while if you uh, have some boost available. Uh, that said, you've got the LA-9RD, uh, with its rocket engine which is also pretty quick and then the figures start falling off for the most part uh, with the exception of uh, some of the uh, aircraft over here such as the yak 3rd which also has the rocket engine but a fairly short boost but that will keep up with you and then the turn fighters tend to be a little bit slower again watch out for that key 84 that's pretty quick for a turn fighter maneuverability well, if you thought of this as a high energy fighter and you put a speed build on it, then the maneuverability is pretty good, especially if you're planning on fighting uh, the other high energy fighters. And as we can see here, it's a little bit better than the Mustangs, a little bit better than the I-220, significantly better than the Kostikov, which is a bit of a brick. Uh, Meteor is actually not that much better. So it's better than that. But then we start getting into fighters that are more mobile and you need to recognize your fighter and not try and turn fight with anything that's going to be significantly able to outturn you. Now, depending on the relative builds of the LA-9RD and the BF-109G, you may be able to outturn that, but you're probably not going to outturn a Yak-3T, a Yak-3RD, a Yak-3, the Spitfires, uh, and the two Japanese aircraft under any circumstances. Bear that in mind, you want to use slash and burn techniques. And slash and burn, I guess, is a variant of boom of, of what I call high energy fighting, uh, where normally you might be fighting the aircraft in a, a, a turn fighting fashion, but then opt to dive in, shoot at an aircraft, and then zoom away if you can. Uh, or, as I call that approach, a slash and burn. And that's what you use against the turn fighters. Altitude performance. Again, this lends itself to that slash and burn um, approach against turn fighters. Generally, you've got pretty good altitude performance against those. The same sort of altitude performance, however, as the rest of the high energy aircraft would have. So the Mustangs will be right up there with you. So will the I-220. The Kostikov certainly will be as well. Not so much the Meteor, interestingly. This is um, a bit of a break. It tends to fight at lower altitudes. And then as you cast your eyes across, you can see that for the most part, the altitude performance is significantly worse. Even on the Key 84, you need to try and get above that. And we just drop down to the worst in class figures. 
we've already talked about the armament. We're not going to talk about survivability because those figures are compressed. Is there anything else we need to watch out for? The minimum optimum speed, that's probably not that significant. And the stall speed is probably not going to bother you either. But just for the record, these are third worst in class on both schools. So what we have is, is on the face of it, a high energy fighter with pretty poor weaponry. However, experience has taught me that although this maneuverability, which on paper doesn't look to be that much better than many of the aircraft that you'd expect this to be fighting, the Mustangs, the I-220, possibly the special aircraft, the Kostikov 302s and the Meteors, you can, if you work hard, improve this and make this quite a capable turn fighter, provided you understand which aircraft you're not going to be using turn fighting tactics against most obviously the Japanese aircraft, the Spitfires uh, and the Yak-3 variants. And then you can do some good work with this plane. And we'll see this in my setup. But quite clearly, there's two possible builds here. You can go for a speed build and try and play it as an out and out high energy fighter um, and using that slightly extra, better maneuverability against your Mustangs in your I-220s. Or you can go for that surprise build that I've just mentioned. This is, however, undoubtedly a difficult aircraft. You will have to play well. You will have to be tactically aware at all times. You will have to pick your engagements carefully in order to get the most out of it. So here we are back on the tarmac outside the hangar, and we're going to talk about how I've set this aircraft up and also discuss an alternative approach. When you first get this aircraft, and I've put it into stock configuration, you'll be missing the following. Out of four equipment slots, you'll be missing one on the airframe and also one on the engine. And of the consumables, you'll be missing, um, well, again, one on the airframe and one on the engine. That's going to hamper you quite a bit, so it's going to be a fairly unpleasant grind to get it up to specialist. However, I have got mine up to specialist, so let's go into that configuration now and let's see what I've done. When you have the aircraft stock, your options are quite limited, and I think I'd probably go for the gun sight. That's an easy choice. But here, I think I'd probably go for the uprated engine, even though it has a higher um, fire risk, and try and make the aircraft as quick as possible and fly it as a pure energy fighter whilst it's stock. It's when you get it specialised that things become interesting. And in my experience, I found that a turn fighter build is actually the way to go. At least it is for me. So what we have is a gun sight. And if we look at the bonus characteristics, because this armament is weak, my approach tends to be, let's try and get some critical damage and let's cause fires as much as possible. So the three bonus characteristics are indeed the ones that I would pick there and try and get a little bit extra, not only do damage, but perhaps also uh, critically damage the aircraft or even set it on fire. Um, you could, if you choose, uh, put on the accuracy um, bonus characteristics instead. That's up to you. It's not the approach that I recommend. And here we go with the turn build on these two slots here. We have a lightweight wing frame. In fact, it's an experimental one and a lightweight power unit. Now, before we talk about those in detail, I just want to show you what the maneuverability figure is. The rating is 83. Um, if you've looked at the spreadsheet section, and I hope you have, will remember that the base figure is 69 so this is a significant improvement it's going to get you turning better than some of the uh, stock aircraft such as the um, LA-7 and the LA-9RD um, got to still watch it with the Spitfires the Japanese aircraft and the Yak-3s of course and we have an average turn time of 9.2 seconds we could probably do a little bit more actually um, that's 1.1 uh, seconds better than the 10.3 that's stock and what I find is that this build overall not only allows me flexibility to fight many aircraft, particularly multi-rolls, particularly um, he even Japanese heavies that are fair, um, fairly good at turning, but because this aircraft has something I didn't mention in the numbers section, the statistics discussion, a very good dive speed and a pretty good climb rate, you can get up and down and then go and combat those high energy fighters for a while as well. So I believe that this build I have makes this aircraft more flexible and also a bit of a surprise. And I think when you've got a, an aircraft with such weak armament and 
on the face of it, a fairly mediocre potential in the game. You want something that's surprising. So let's go through this in detail. We bring up the bonus characteristics. And I wouldn't have these bonus characteristics that I've selected here. Um, there's more your maneuverability to be had, a 1% characteristic that I haven't selected, and a 0.5% um, maneuverability in turns. I've got 0.5% your, your maneuverability already selected. Those are the three characteristics that, if I were reassembling this equipment now, I would select just to get a bit more maneuverability. On the lightweight power unit, we can see that here, I'd probably try and get the 2% your maneuverability on the basis that if I'm going to go for this maneuverability build, let's maximize the potential. And then I'd probably pick off acceleration with boost and without boost as opposed to 1% cruise speed, yeah, I would probably keep those two characteristics I've got selected, drop the cruise speed, and get the yaw maneuverability. But equally, you could argue that you should have the two cruise speeds and the yaw maneuverability. Now, the fire risk is pretty good, but I haven't put on an upgraded engine in the, uh, the uh, specialist build. What we've got is uh, a boost mixture injection system, and here, the bonus characteristics, Oops, taking them off, let's get them back. 10% engine cooldown rate. I would also want to get the 5% engine cooldown rate, and then it's a question of picking off one of the other characteristics. Maximum speed with boost uh, or acceleration. I think the acceleration is actually a good one to use there. Okay. What else could you do? Well, your other option is to play to this aircraft's apparent strengths and go for a speed build. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me just demonstrate. You take off the lightweight wing frame and put on a polished skin. And I happen to have an experimental polished skin lying around in the depot. Should be using that somewhere, really. And you'd also put on the uprated engine. And we have an ultimate uprated engine in the depot as well. Now, let's just quickly look at what's happened to the maneuverability. It's come down to 17. Now, because of other effects, pilot skills and the like, that's still a little bit better than the 69 base maneuverability, but obviously almost no difference at all. And you're not going to be using this aircraft as a turn fighter at all. On the airspeed side, though, we've got a huge increase of 43 miles per hour on the cruise speed, and that will get you about the map quickly. And provided you keep the aircraft quick and you don't keep using the air brake to slow down to stay behind things, for example, you should be able to run away from things that you don't like the look of, for the most part. Boost speed has also gone up very slightly, of course. We had the boost in mixture injection system on already, so there are no surprises that that's gone up a little bit. And that, of course, means that the rate of climb, because I've got the boost mixture injection system on, and this is true of both builds, is a little bit better at 491, but the base is 462, and that climb rate is pretty stellar. You can definitely make use of that. So, if you're good at high energy fighting, if you like your Mustangs and fight well in them, there's no reason why you shouldn't use this alternative build. Um, I would recommend that you try both. In fact, I probably will at some point. I'll probably get this into test mode, which you can always drop into here by using this test button and seeing if actually I have a distinct preference for one or the other builds or whether I like it both equally. And wouldn't it be nice if we had that World of Tanks um, uh, feature whereby you could have different builds for the same tank on planes? Maybe that'll come in the future. Right. I think it's time to talk about consumables. And what we have here, I'm just going to reset here in case I apply this by accident and waste six tokens. So we're back to the, the turn build here. Um, and because I haven't got the uprated engine on and I haven't affected the fire resistance, which is already pretty good, I'm able to put on a first aid dressing package, which means that if I do get my pilot shot out by a rear gunner, I can put my pilot back in. That's really useful. Pneumatic control assist for helping me in a type spot, perhaps with another BF 109G or something else that's got similar turn rate. Engine cooling, I, as you know, I mount this on almost all my aircraft. If you've got any boost at all, this will give you an extra 10 seconds on top. Engine restart, if you are interested in a speed build, you might consider putting on the mixture control, but believe you me, if you get your engine knocked out, you're in serious trouble, so I prefer the engine restart. 
and then universal ammunition. Uh, there are gold options, but as you know, I never used them. Okay, so let's go and discuss pilot skills. Let's create a little space by collapsing these items. There we go. When it comes to building a pilot for this aircraft, my first choice would be Aerodynamics Expert, which increases the effect of equipment on speed and maneuverability by 40%. And I would do that even if the aircraft was stock. And certainly, uh, as I go into Specialist, it would be my number one skill. And for a maneuverability build such as I have, number two skill would be Aerobatics Expert. And after that, I would concentrate on this block of four skills. Probably go Engine Guru 1 first, then Marksman 1. And engine guru 2 and then engine uh, marksman 2 as well and that's probably far enough for the moment because after that you're into some long grinds for extra skills um, but i have a skill point assigned here to a firefighter at the moment uh, could have possibly put that on eagle eyed actually considering i haven't got an uprated engine installed but eventually i might look to put on uh, resilience which is a favorite skill of mine if you're going for the speed build it's Similar, but I would probably get Aerodynamics Expert and then not bother with Aerobatics Expert. In fact, I would concentrate on getting these two skills first, Engine Guru 1 and Engine Guru 2. But on the way, you would probably put on Marksman 1, maybe take it off in order to get Engine Guru 2, and then, having done that, build up the Marksman skills again. Right. I think it's time to go and see what this aircraft can do in battle. The map for the forthcoming battle is Albion. It's the final argument variant, five sector map, laid out in the um, five spots of a die configuration. And in the centre, we've got a tactically important as well as strategically important airbase. Uh, very useful when these are in the middle of the map because not only do you get your five resor three resources every five seconds, but you can also spawn here. Um, you can also select a different aircraft of the same tier if you're destroyed or get full repairs. And about the airbase on one axis are a pair of military bases, one near each spawn point. These are strategically the most important sectors because they will launch rocket strikes on other sectors and try and flip them to your side. And then on the other axis, the make weight uh, sectors are a pair of garrisons. So the way to win this map is to seize control of the airbase and try and hold it for longer than the enemy. Certainly hold your military base. And if you can, if you have this airbase, use that advantage to try and launch an assault on the enemy military base and capture that. And if you hold these three sectors, the chances are that you're going to get a very easy win. So if we look at the order of battle, we can see I'm top tier in my BF-109G. I have a bf 109s filling, twin. So that's the twin engine, twin boom, um, twin engined uh, version of the 109. Uh, with me, a B-32 bomber, carpet bomber. Pretty powerful, but not as powerful as the B-29C, of course, at Tier 8, fortunately, not Tier for Tier. Another bomber, the Dornier 217M, a P-38J Lightning, and a Tornado. And the enemy has a Yak-9U, which can snipe you at long distance, so I don't want that to happen. An IL-10 Grand Attacker, a true energy high-energy fighter in the shape of the P-51D, and then a pair of Ki 102s, highly maneuverable uh, heavy fighters, so dangerous opponents with big guns. And then also a Dornio 217M. Now, I'm going to say that I thought this was favourable matchmaking, not least because there are no Spitfires, no Japanese term fighters, and no Yak 3s uh, to contend with. Uh, had there been, I may have gone about this game differently, but instantly I thought I was going to try and seize control of the central airbase and then keep an eye on the military bases to make sure that we got at least one of them. Had there been a lot of turn fighters in the game, I would have possibly gone to the military base to make sure I got control of that. And then if the situation looked bad here, I'd try and do a peripheral tour and take the peripheral sectors. Let's see how this battle turned out. As we go into battle, let me mention that this is a World of Warplanes replay file. Unfortunately, my natively recorded version proved to be too choppy to use. Secondly, if the game looks different, that's because I've removed most of my modifications. As I said in the strategy section, we're going to try and take the airbase first. So we begin to climb. Going slightly to the left. Could be the right. I just want to avoid anything flying through the airbase that may have big guns.
pretty good climb rate on this aircraft. Beginning to get up to maximum optimum, well, not maximum altitude, optimum altitude. Wiggling around a bit in case of some stray flak. And now we turn in to look and see what's ahead of us. We can see many of the air defense aircraft. And now the enemy is appearing as well. First thing that's heading towards me is actually a bomber, but then I spot that one of the key 102s is off to my right, and I decide that's a bigger threat, and I want it out. Land the 30mm cannon, and it doesn't last long. Swing round, I'm using the X key a lot here. The X key is bound to lock near his target. Managed to avoid the other key 102. Swing round onto the fighter. And now I'm in a turn fight with a key, eight, a key 61. Now, if this was a human piloted key 61, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd have used my boost, climbed away, and the perhaps hammerhead turned and came come down upon it in the dive. As it was, I took a chance because it was a bot. Get onto the bomber, and now you'll see how this weaponry can be a bit frustrating. I can't knock even a tier six bomber down very quickly. And I begin to feel pressure from behind moment and I break off and just in time because the Corsair was going to shoot me from behind. So I turn on the Corsair, having noted that my team have taken the air base in the meantime as well as the military base and the local garrison. So we've had a good start. And that's not the reticle being off target, that's just bad shooting for me, but it is quite hard to land this 30mm cannon. And finally, we dispose of the Corsair, pick up some soil samples and return to the, the base, look for more threats, and key 102, drops one bomb, drops another, small blast radius, so I wasn't in much danger there, but should have watched out for it. And I put him down. Now, I think that was bad play by the key 102. I would have approached it by trying to clear out the top of the sector first and then coming down to use the ordnance when there were no threats or few threats. As it was, he just exposed himself to fighters. In this case, it was me, and he lost his aircraft without doing a great deal to the airbase. Shoot at the Corsair as it came into the base. I easily outmaneuver it and get on its tail. Finish it off. Swoop upwards towards the Key 61 and blow that out of the sky. Swing around rapidly. Another Corsair. And with some good shooting, I rapidly whittle that down as well. And he goes. Now we're looking for another target. And this is the first time I've seen the P-51D. And between me and the air defence heavy, he melts. Low flying bomber, which I have to disengage from unfortunately because otherwise it's a ramming situation with the Corsair means I don't get that kill, just assistance. Turning around to confront new threats coming in from the spawn point. See the key 102. He turns away. There's a multi-roll which could latch onto me if I go for the key 102, so I decide to go for the Corsair instead. He begins his circle of death. I hit him with a 30mm cannon. Finish him off a bit better than I finished off the one that was down the, the right hand side of the airbase a, a couple of minutes ago. And this is our opportunity to get in at this military base. Begin to climb looking for the air defence aircraft. Lots of my team are going into this base. Uh, it's good to try and keep this aircraft as part of a group. Get isolated in one of these and you can be in trouble. Nearly destroy the air defence aircraft. My team flipped this as quickly as that. At the moment we've got both military bases, but we look like we may lose the airfield. Need to get back there as quickly as possible. And we can see that there are at least four enemy aircraft in the airfield. I can see the Yak-9U, which is a human player. For a start, there's the P-51D off to the left. The Key 61 flies conveniently across me, and as we need to kill things quickly, I go for it. And I very nearly obliterate it with the 
30 millimeter cannon. Now in the meantime, the Yak 9U hasn't latched onto me, so we can see it in the Corsair. We can go for that. Don't want that to shoot me either. Quickly turn and get on its tail. Almost lost the airfield. With that kill, we keep it a bit longer, just as well, because we've now lost our military base, our local one. Let's see what else we can kill here. And unfortunately, one of the air defence aircraft goes down before I can kill the, the Yak 9U, which I just have. I then kill the bot Yak 9. We're in a turn fight. And if I had a speed build, I wouldn't handle the engagement this way. As I'm not, it turns out the P-51D tried to turn with me and now has to settle for trying to kill the heavy before he loses his aircraft to me. And down he goes. Fortunately, he just got out of the sector, so it didn't count to flipping it. The wind legend goes through. Akamatsu went through a few moments ago. That's the key 61 down again. Turn to engage the air defense heavy. Some good shots into him. More good shooting whittles down almost the rest of his health. Pause to let the guns cool down and then finish him off. Avoid the Corsair and flip round quickly to get on its tail. Now our military base has flipped to garrison so we have a healthy lead. So even if we lose the sector we should be alright from here. See the P-51D again. He tries to go into a turn fight with me. With this build, that's not going to work. Easily outturn him. Put him on fire. Keep turning. He tries to run away. And down he goes, and he won't be coming back. That's the hero of the sky. And as I turn round, I take a big hit. And that's from the Yak-9U. But even with this damaged wing, and given that he didn't manoeuvre to try and turn with me, I'm still able to get on his tail and finish him off. Lots of red around me, but by being highly manoeuvrable I can survive. And with that aircraft, for which I've got assistance I believe, we'd retake the airbase. I take another big hit and that turns out to be from one of the key 102s. And even though I've got another damaged wing, I can easily outturn the heavy. A little bit of avoidance to make sure I didn't get hit by his big gun, and then he decides to run. And at this point, I realise his rear gunner might very well take me out, and the loss of my engine, which I do put back in straight away, encourages me to go and pick up a little bit of repairs before we have another engagement. Now, he saw that, and he came straight back for me. But I've already got three quarters of health. I know I can take a hit from him. I go into avoidance anyway. He completely and utterly fails to hit me. I engage engine cooling and I chase him down. And that's the last action of the game. And the last action of the game is the ace. 20,625 personal points, a lot of medals and a very satisfactory game for this maneuverability build on the BF-109G. Let's review the outcome of this battle, and as we can see from the centre, it's 5 chevron battle, or a grade 1 fighter. 156,512 credits gross, um, we can see that 40,000, 39,000 uh, came from a premium account bonus, and other bonuses were in operations as operation as well. Uh, if we look at the expenses, there are none, the aircraft wasn't shot down, so no repair costs, and uh, I was using prepaid consumables as usual. We look at the aircraft experience, 5,072 in total, base is 2,416, premium account bonus of 1,200 and other bonuses bumping that figure up. Free experience, 253, that's 193 base with 60 for the premium account bonus. Got three tokens, all for the first medals of the day. There's a Marseille, a Hero of the Sky and an Ace. Uh, but in amongst here, uh, uh, epic achievements that were earned earlier in the day, an Akamatsu and a Winged Legend. Let's have a look at the personal score tab. We can see that two of the class specific missions are complete. The third one, destroying aircraft when defending, is four fifths complete, hence the five chevrons. 
20,625 personal points with two sectors captured, 20 targets are destroyed, exactly the number you need for this, of course. 5,726 damage to aerial targets and that 30mm cannon dealt 34 critical hits. Capture points, 640, and that was split. 280 for defending and 360 for attacking. And if we take a look at the team score tab, we can see that uh, that was enough for first place. This would have been on both teams, both by personal points and by chevrons. The B-32, unsurprisingly, making a decent contribution, and also the Tornado there, not too far behind the Dornier uh, as well, uh, the down-tiered bomber. Uh, the enemy team, a lot of them gave it a good go. P-51D I saw fighting for all he was worth in the centre a couple of times. This is a good effort from a down-tiered uh, Dornier 217M bomber. And the IL-10 also put himself about. This was a good battle to win. That brings me to the end of my look at the BF-109G. And I'd like to thank YouTube subscriber Asif Talper for requesting a video on this plane. Asif, I'm sorry it's taken so long to do, but I hope you still find it interesting. Secondly, on paper the BF-109G looks like a high energy fighter, albeit with poor weaponry. And because of that poor weaponry, I've demonstrated the virtues of a surprise maneuverability build, which in the right matchup can work very well. Well, I hope you found that useful, and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. But until then, this is the Noble Q, signing out.